Today I have with me Kevin O'Brien. Kevin is a longtime white collar defense lawyer, previously having been a prosecutor in the Eastern District of New York. We take a deep dive into the Elizabeth Holmes trial. We look at the prosecution's case in chief. We consider Elizabeth Holmes' testimony on direct examination by her lawyers and where the case may be headed down the road. I know you'll enjoy this fascinating look at the Holmes case. Are you interested in learning about how design thinking can improve your compliance program? Then check out my latest podcast, Design Thinking and Compliance, where with my co-host, Karsten Tams, we explore this question. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And boy, are you in for a treat today. I have with me Kevin O'Brien, and we are going to explore the Elizabeth Holmes trial. Uh, We've been trying to do this podcast for a while, and when we originally got together, we were going to look at perhaps what the trial might look like. But as it worked out, uh, we weren't able to record until uh, November 30. So uh, I think it's going to be much more fun, Kevin, because we're going to get to kind of Monday morning quarterback, what happened? And now we have Elizabeth Holmes herself on the stand. So um, before we get started, could you tell our listeners a little bit about your professional background and describe your current practice? Sure, Tom. Uh, I've been a a white collar practitioner for 30 years plus, served uh, in the Justice Department as a prosecutor before that in the Eastern District of New York, which is the site of quite a few famous cases, especially recently. Um, I've had over 20 jury trials. My most recent case uh, in court in 2019, we we were involved in the Platinum Partners case, a huge hedge fund here in New York that imploded. And I represented the CFO and he, he walked out of court a free man. He was acquitted of every count in July of 2019. And since then, I've been doing counseling. Most of the job is trying to keep people from being indicted or going to jail. And that's what I've been spending most of my time doing. Kevin, let's turn to the trial itself. But before we uh, get into the details, maybe I want, if we could explore for those listeners who just jetted in from Mars, uh, what is the Elizabeth Holmes trial? Why is it so significant? Or why do you see so many interesting issues in this case? Well, it's interesting on numerous levels. It is a huge case. The, the government is been at it now for about uh, two months. They've put on 29 or 30 witnesses, uh, introduced numerous emails and other documents. Just the logistics of it uh, have been huge. It's also unusual because um, you don't see many uh, fraud cases in the world of private equity hedge fund investment, especially in Silicon Valley. Um, they're rare. And so this is noteworthy for that. And, uh, and it, it, it's exposed a lot of, I don't think many people, even lawyers realize how customs work in this field. And it's exposed a lot of those during the course of the trial. Finally, of course, there's Elizabeth Holmes, who's a noteworthy person and, uh, uh, made herself a celebrity a la Steve Jobs. And, uh, and now she's partly paying the price for that. She was up front then uh, in the limelight, and now some of her past statements and uh, and uh, representations, I think, have come back to haunt her some. Um, and frankly, she is a woman, and that makes her, you know, doubly unusual. And there, there's been some commentary focused focused on that fact as well. Kevin, uh, when we were going to start this pod or when we first proposed it, you were going to maybe talk about some of the weakness, excuse me, the strengths you saw in the prosecution's case pretrial. But now that we've had the prosecution rest its case in chief, what did you see as some of the strengths the prosecution brought out? Well, it appears from this distance, and I haven't been at the trial, and that's a significant qualifier because you don't get a feel for the interaction which goes on in court and which the jury experiences every single day. Uh, But from this remove, 
the government's case was extraordinarily careful and, and well planned, and I think well executed. I mean, they had they had they had victims, so to speak, come in and testify. Uh, false readings. One woman was falsely told she had a miscarriage. Another person was falsely told um, uh, he had prostate cancer. Um, these are these are uh, striking human events, which surely would have resonated with the jury. But none of these victims, and there were a number of them, had interactions with Ms. Holmes herself. And that's really the core of the case. What did she say um, to induce people, if anything, um, to, uh, to uh, follow her under false pretenses or fraudulent misrepresentations? And for that, the government did several things. They called, they called a number of uh, people who worked in the, uh, in the lab, the company lab. And this, tel- this testimony was extremely telling. The, the, the very first lab director for the company, a fellow named Rosendorf, testified for five days. And he was cross-examined for a full day after that. <clears throat> and... Um, he really laid out a litany of, 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 of misstatements and falsehoods that, was, that set the tone, I think, for the government's case. He came on early. Um, among them, uh, he told, he told uh, Ms. Holmes directly at some point that they couldn't go forward with a product launch because the test didn't work, um, the so-called mini-labs or Edison's were not working. They had a 40% failure rate. Uh, none of the testing that had been done today met with um, uh, uh, government, uh, would have met with government approval, and that therefore they should halt the lot, launch. And she basically said no. I mean, she was shaken. Uh, she was upset. Uh, but she went ahead with the launch. And eventually, by 2015, I believe, Mr. Rosendorf just had to quit. They were about to do, advertise another testing success that was, in fact, not a testing success. That she felt, that he felt rather, they 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 couldn't justly represent to the public as something they could properly do, and so he quit. And the story really went downhill from there. Um, interesting thing about the chronology of the case, I think it, it, that. According to the government, the scheme started in 2009. The company, I believe, was founded in 2006. So there was a three-year period there where, where they really didn't have a company or a, a product. And the defense tended to focus on what happened um, during those first three years, um, where everything was sweetness and light, and they were just talking about things look good, things look promising, this expert says this technology will work. This expert says they'll make X million dollars within the next three years, that sort of thing. And, and, those, were, and those were easy statements to make uh, by the company. But when the rubber hit the road starting in around 2009 and increasingly every year thereafter, things became more difficult. So the, the, the government's case was really focused on the post-2009 period. So in a way, you had uh, two ships passing in the night to some extent. The defense focused on, on one set of facts. And this was also true in the case of her testimony so far. She's taken the stand, of course. And she focused on the earlier period and how great everything was. And she never knew there were these problems. Everyone was telling her this looked so promising and was going to be such a, such a success. And she was shocked, shocked to find out when the Wall Street Journal article came out in late 2015 that none of these things were true. Um, but the government had been focusing on that period of time all along, the latter period of time. And I think that was, that was interesting. The question is whether the jury will um, be alert to this disjunct in the chronology focused by each side. Um, but as I said, the, government, the government's proof um, 
was uh, multifaceted. They put on investors and business partners uh, who told stories that were um, hard hitting and in fact, sometimes shocking. Um, and finally, they put on journalists. Uh, I think their last witness was Roger Parloff, who flatly said that Holmes had lied to him and gave a you know a laundry list of things to sort of top off the government's case. Um, she she told him that the mini labs can do anything that the, a Quest diagnostic central lab can do, which, based on the evidence, does not appear to be true. Um, that they, they never use third-party devices to do blood tests when, in fact, they did. Even when they didn't tell people they were doing that, they weren't using their own devices. They were using other people's devices, which is why when dignitaries and, and celebrities and investors came through the lab and they said, let us take your let us let us take a blood reading. You know, let's let's use a, a one of our finger devices and and um, and we'll we'll test your blood. They couldn't give the the people involved a result right away. They said, oh, this will take 48 hours. And what they were doing was sending it to a lab somewhere and having it uh, properly tested. Um, uh, he also said that she told him that uh, the, the mini labs were being used in Afghanistan by the armed forces. But, oh, we can't tell you about it because of government secrecy and confidentiality concerns. But based on the evidence that came in, there was no such government contract um, um, the Defense Department looked at this briefly, but did not go forward with it. Uh, and finally, uh, she didn't disclose to Parloff that somewhere, like somewhere in the in the neighborhood of forty percent of the tests were being done uh, venously, the old-fashioned way, not using the the finger prick device. So he sort of summarized the greatest hits, so to speak. And what looked, again, from this remove to be a very effective presentation. So the government had all this, and they, they covered all the ground. And the impact um, uh, to this observer was telling. The, uh, let me turn now to the defense. In pretrial, we heard, uh, I think, a lot of information that Elizabeth Holmes was going to essentially erase, uh, erase an abused spouse-type defense that she was bullied into this by her partner, Sonny Bulwani, who was a COO of Theranos and her uh, paramour. Um, she is now beginning her fourth day on the witness stand, and uh, yesterday, near the end, uh, she began to articulate that defense, but up until that time, uh, at least my readings in the papers, where she came across as the Elizabeth Holmes we saw on television. It's very self-assured, very calm, very persuasive, a woman who is very much in charge of a company. And I really wanted to use that long-winded introduction to, to maybe explore with you uh, putting her on the stand, the risks of putting her on the stand, certainly the upside of putting her on the stand. But did these first three days maybe take away from uh, what may be the ultimate defense that she's going to say, I was bullied into uh, making these fraudulent statements. Yes, it wasn't only the first three days. It was the entire course of the government's case. They knew this was coming. So they, they carefully planted questions of various witnesses to the effect of, did she appear to be in charge? Was she on top of details? Uh, who gave the presentation? Was it Sonny, her partner, or... Elizabeth Holmes herself, and the answer to almost all these questions was, it was Elizabeth Holmes. Uh, the, the, the opinion seemed to be that she was fully in charge and ran the show. So with that planted, um, you know, there's a, there's a certain, it's, it's not really fertile soil for a defense of this kind. Um, uh, and, and the government's cross, I believe, will begin today. Of her, so we'll see how that goes. But certainly, it was not fertile soil for this kind of defense. But the other thing I'll say, though, is she gave an account I, I thought was moving of, of alleged 
um, abuse in the relationship between Sonny Bolwani and herself. And uh, let me put it this way. A jury to find her guilty does not have to disbelieve that account. It, it was it was moving uh, and forceful, and she had documentary evidence in the form of emails and text messages to back it up. But the point, in terms of the trial, I mean, obviously there's a human element here, and, and we should always take these allegations seriously. But the point, from the trial point of view is that none of it had anything to do with her carrying out of her responsibilities as the head of this company. She even admitted to her lawyer that Bowani never told her or forced her or ordered her to do anything. Um, this may have colored her judgment, she wanted to suggest. But again, cut to all the other witnesses who almost uniformly pointed out she was cool and collected in command of the details and clearly appeared to be running the ship. So uh, effective as it may have been on one level, I, I, I don't think it really engaged the government's proof. Um, but you know, the chemistry is a hard thing to predict, in a, especially in a trial of this length and complexity. And certainly, I, I think one tactical consequence of her testimony yesterday was that the government may be a little more careful in how they cross-examine her. Um, they don't want to become the Sonny Balwani of this trial. And I think that may um, cause a certain amount of inhibition in the way they cross-examine her today and subsequent days. But apart from that, I don't think that I don't think the testimony um, on this subject, which people have been talking about for a while, I don't think it's going to have a significant impact on what the jury decides. Again, I could be wrong. I'm not there. Uh, and we'll be right back with more from Kevin O'Brien after this message from our sponsor. So go ahead. We recent, yeah, we recently had some very high profile trials, Kyle Rittenhouse, the Ahmed Aubrey case, where the defendants took the stand, and uh, I think in both cases it really sealed the jury's mind, or at least helped seal the the jury's verdict. And I don't want to go into those trials, but uh, rarely do we see the defendants take the stand, and certainly uh, in this case adds to that. And I really wanted to explore with you. How would you think through that decision as a defense lawyer uh, about putting a defendant on the stand? Well, it is a very uh, risky step, as everyone has pointed out. Um, but, you know, in these cases, everything is relative. If your case is not going well, um, why not? And um, um, I think that may have been part of the consideration here. Uh, they needed something to sort of um, revamp, uh, take the initiative, give the jury something to think about, take the uh, take the offense away from the the government and give it to uh, Ms. Holmes. And what better way to do that than by by having her testify in her own defense? Um, I think Rittenhouse was a different case. I think I just don't think. The, the prosecution was prepared for him to take. No one thought he would take the stand. Um, you know, he's not, a, he's not sophisticated in a courtroom um, or a boardroom um, the way Elizabeth Holmes is. And he did a remarkably good job testifying, I think, which, again, surprised the prosecution. And the, the net result was... Um, successful for him. But I think this case is different. They've, they've known or suspected for a while that she would do this. Um, it's hard to put on an, 
you know, an abuse case like the one she advertised, if you don't yourself take the witness stand. So they knew or strongly suspected this was coming. And I, I would expect that today they'll be well prepared. Uh, let me pick up on a phrase you said earlier. I hope I wrote it down wrong. Uh, you called it the feel for the interaction in the courtroom. And then you talked about the intangibles, uh, the interaction between witness and jury, the interaction between counsel and witness, the interaction between the court and the jury. And I was wondering uh, if you're a defense lawyer or a prosecutor, are you, when you're in the middle of that action, are you well suited to try to understand that feel? Or do you have associates at counsel table or perhaps in the gallery who help you try to assess that feel? That's a good question. I, I, I like to have one person who's sort of watching the jury at all times. If, if I have a large enough team, which you sometimes don't, um, have a person at, at our table who's just focusing on what the jury is doing or possibly saying, uh, even during breaks. Uh, I remember a, there was a famous case years ago when I was, I think, still a prosecutor, the Imelda Marcos case. And Jerry Spence came into town to represent her. And all, and all the sophisticates in New York sort of made fun of this. What does this cowboy know about a white collar case? Well, she was acquitted, to make a long story short. And they interviewed one of the jurors afterwards. And he or she said, well, we thought Ms. Marcos was a very nice person. And the journalist said, why did you think that? Because Mr. Spence, during breaks, the first thing he did was pour her a glass of water and go over and sit next to her and talk to her. And he did that every single time. And it sent a message that resonated with enough jurors that she she walked away free. So those kinds of things, those kinds of things do matter. Um, and you're right. You should keep your pulse on that somehow as best you can. Sitting here, you and I have no way of knowing what's, what's, what's going on in, in that courtroom. And that's, a, that's an important qualifier. The jury makes the ultimate decision. Now, let me ask you to put yourself in the shoes of the prosecutor. And you, uh, you mentioned about uh, the potential cross-examination of Elizabeth Holmes. My first question is, would you assign this to a female prosecutor uh, to avoid really any of the even looking like abuse, or uh, do you think juries are beyond something like that? I think they're beyond something like that. I, I, you know, they, I don't think they did that here. I, I, I can't account for every member of the, of the government's team, but it seems like most of the examinations have been conducted by men. It'll be interesting to see who uh, cross examines her today. Um, but yeah, I think juries have moved beyond that. And when you do something like that, it's kind of painfully obvious sometimes, and therefore it backfires. So I wouldn't counsel that. So if you were going to try to play out this sort of abuse spouse defense, uh, you've already talked about uh, perhaps the uh, the abusal claims, even if true, might not speak directly to the fraud she's alleged to have engaged in, would you try to tie her actions that may have been alleged fraud to some of the abuse, or would you try to take it in a different direction? That's a good question. I, you know, if there is some hook the defense had to connect the two, I would certainly, I would certainly use that uh, as much as I possibly could. And I don't know what in the government's proof, which was voluminous and, and well orchestrated, I don't know what in the government's proof would serve that purpose, frankly. Um, there, I'm speaking hypothetically, but there may be a period where she wasn't so actively involved. There may have been a period of a week or a couple of days or a couple of weeks where she wasn't meeting investors or dealing with the lab director and she testified yesterday that there were periods where she was injured and not well, um, uh, bruised um, as a result of the misconduct that allegedly took place. And if they could tie her absence from certain events to that kind of 
conduct, that, that would make a difference, possibly. Um, beyond that, you say take it to another level. That's probably where it's going to remain. Um, they're just trying to point out that she's human, that she suffered in a dysfunctional relationship. She didn't keep her eye on the ball. Um, she was pressured into sort of ultra macho behavior by Bolwani. That was part of the testimony. She, he belittled her and said, you're not being, you're not behaving like a man in effect. And, uh, you know, you've got to, you've got to become a new Elizabeth Holmes, that kind of thing. I mean, that's, that's chilling on its own terms, right? But beyond that, I think it, it could lead the jury in a certain direction. Um, but I think that's a, that's a long shot. But when, when you don't have a, a lot of other evidence, why not take the long shot? Uh, let me turn uh, back to the plaintiff, excuse me, the prosecutor's case in chief. And I thought uh, there were a couple of parts in their case which really favored the defense. And it was along the lines of uh, the former Walgreens CEO and several of the investors who basically said, uh, you know, we were betting on the come here. We th- we hoped there would be a truly revolutionary medical device change. And, uh, you know, we may have been promised things that didn't turn out, but that's that's what investors like, like us do. And then overlay on that, James Mathis, the former Secretary of Defense, who testified after he was asked to be on a board, he went down to Barnes & Noble and bought a book on how to be a board member, which spoke to me about the, the level of sophistication right. of the board members, not that they were not uh, great men or women in their own right in their own fields, but they didn't have the experience in corporate governance uh, that's needed. Uh, do will any of those were any of those weaknesses in the plaintiff's case from your perspective? Yeah, they were, and and the, and the defense did spend a, a, a lot of time on this during cross examination. But when you think about it for a second, again, there's sort of a disconnect. I think um, someone who acts foolishly doesn't deserve to be lied to, <laughs> and that's the essence of the of the government's case here that these people went in making huge, and I mean enormous investments. I think think she raised almost a billion dollars during the course of this company. I think it was $950 I may be wrong, but that's a number I saw in the record. And some of these people um, uh, behave so poorly, it's just hard to believe. Uh, one one test one testified based on, he did no due diligence and he's being challenged on that he, he said it just felt revolutionary I mean you don't invest in a public company let's say uh, based on feelings but in this world which is thinly regulated uh, on the assumption that wealthy men and women are smart enough to protect their money and sophisticated enough to do that. They don't need the help of the government. Um, In this world, things like that pass muster. It it, it was remarkable. But again, I think the defense, I think the government's response is going to be sure. In retrospect, um, investor X, uh, investor Y, uh, board member Z acted foolishly. But they're entitled to assume that when people speak to them about the company and about its prospects, when they're making a major, major investment, they will be told the truth. And here they were not told the truth. And I think that sort of cuts through it in a way that may be effective for the government. Conclude with asking you, do you see any other directions the defense could go at this point, or is the home's testimony, both uh, direct and cross, will probably end the defendant's case, and then we'll have closing arguments? Uh, I don't know who they would call besides Ms. Holmes. There was talk earlier of putting on an expert to talk about spousal abuse and things related to that. I'm not sure that will happen. It would, it would, putting on an expert in a criminal case, uh, if you're a defendant, is 
usually not a good idea. I'm not sure they'll follow through with that here. Uh, beyond that, I don't know what witnesses they would call. I mean, there are things they can comb through the record and find. And a number of these people who claim to have been victimized by false statements were complimentary of her throughout the process. Good luck. We think you're on to a great idea here, that sort of thing. Even as they're backing out, we love you. <laughs> now, I don't know what that, does that say more about the state of mind of Silicon Valley investors or, or does it speak to her integrity? The jury's going to have to make that decision. But there, but there are things of that kind in the, in the record. And little impeachment nuggets for most of the government witnesses. No witness is, comes in with a clean slate. There's always something that the defense can use to cross-examine them with, some inconsistency, some flaw in their past, some mistake that they've made. And the defense did a thorough job uh, um, picking up on those in the case of most of the most of the government's witnesses. The question is, is, is that critical mass going to be enough in conjunction with Holmes's testimony to get them to reasonable doubt? That's, of course, all we're talking about here. It could happen. But for, again, from this vantage point, it's, it's definitely an uphill battle. Unlike some cases I've been involved with, the, the government uh, appears to have done its job here, but we'll have to wait and see. If our listeners wanted any more information on yourself or your firm, where could they go? Sure. We have a, Fort O'Brien is our firm. We have a, a website, fortobrien.com. I'm also uh, profiled in LinkedIn, and there's stuff there about uh, cases I've had and articles I've written, and you know, I welcome people to look if they're interested. Well, Kevin, as I said, uh, I judge how good a podcast is by how much I enjoy it. And I really enjoyed this podcast. Uh, I hope perhaps we can continue this conversation. I like that. And thanks for the opportunity, Tom. I appreciate it. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. I hope we will check out the latest addition to the Compliance Podcast Network, Hidden Traffic, podcast hosted by Gwen Hassan. Gwen takes a look at human trafficking and modern slavery in all its forms, but more importantly, what can you as the compliance professional do to help fight this international scourge? Check out Hidden Traffic, newly premiered on the Compliance Podcast Network. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.